Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, December 21st, 2020. Today, Trump provides cover for Russia, even as the State Department and prominent Republican senators recognize Russia for the recent hack. White House officials were preparing to release a statement on the Russia hack when they were ordered to stand down. Kushner helped create shell companies to launder campaign money to the family. Fox News walks back comments after the threat of legal action. And a federal judge rules that a Fox News host of a show called UnPC can sue a co-host for sending her dick pics. I'm your host, A.G., And I'm Dana Goldberg. Yeah, the show's called (laughs) UnPC. I I tried to keep a shot in the introduction when I said I'm Dana Goldberg. When you end the introduction with that, like Mm. her co-host is sending her dick pics. I'm like, I, I, what is... Okay. Down with political correctness, and I sue you for dick pics. I Amazing. love it. I know. It's incredible. I'm going to spread a shit ton of lies, but there's a line. <laughs> uh, now, we have, a, we have a good show today. I'll be talking with Adam Klasfeld from Law and Crime. He's going to give us updates on the latest election lawsuit victories, because uh, that's all we've got. And... Uh, we'll have uh, civil rights attorney Andrew Laufer on to discuss the very bizarre and possibly seditious Oval Office meeting from the weekend. And of course, Dana and I will be reading the good news at the end of the show. Did you have a, a relaxing weekend? I, you know, I did. I, I This year's coming to an end and I, I can feel it. I don't know if the listeners can feel it, but holy shit, AG, like... I am, if there is a brick wall left to hit, I feel like I'm very close to it. <laughs> yeah. 2020, I think, isn't going to go quietly into that good night. Oh, so I know, I know. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, maybe I'll just get a helmet. Like, that's, <laughs> I think that's probably the best bet. Like, and we're going to hit it. I might as well just be prepared. Like Natalie Portman in Garden State, just wear it all the time. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That was a, a very adorable helmet. Um. <laughs> She makes everything look whimsical. But yeah, yeah, it's it's been uh I mean, I don't even know how we're gonna wrap this year up. Uh <laughs> I feel like the last show of the year should just be like, Y'all know what happened. See yeah. you next week. <laughs> That's it. You know what you know what happened. We'll see you tomorrow. We told you all about it every day. You're you're good. Um, but we do have a lot of headlines to get to. Let's do that. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right, everybody, lead story today from originally from Business Insider, then Daily Coast and Axios put something out. And I was like, eh, but then the New York Times picked it up and it wasn't Maggie Hammerman. So I was like, (laughs) okay. Uh, anyway, the story is that Donald Trump's son-in-law and chief advisor Jared Kushner approved a creation approved the creation of a shell company that secretly paid Trump's family members and spent almost half of the campaign's 1.26 billion dollar war chest. That would amount to a cool 617 million cash, supposedly meant for Trump's re-election campaign, that essentially disappeared without a trace. The shell company appears to have served as a pass-through entity. Uh, with the added benefit of shielding all of its transactions from public view. As we know, and Dana, you and I have talked about this, the new National Defense Authorization Act had a provision in it saying you could no longer shield shell company transactions. And I think that's why Trump is still talking about vetoing it. Uh, but th- because of because this happened over the last couple of years, the, that $617 million is just gone. But, but... Uh, the company was created in April of 2018. It was headed by Trump daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, and President Mike Pence's nephew, John Pence, It was the vice president. So they surely kept things on the up and up. Additionally, the Trump campaign's CFO, Sean Dahlman, became the shell company's treasurer. And we all know what a tight ship Dahlman ran at Trump's campaign. Business Insider appears to have had one key anonymous source, but adds Insider independently verified the details of this person's account with other sources close to the Trump campaign. And Dana, like I said, it eventually worked its way up to the New York Times, who I'm sure verified multiple additional sources. The real genius of this shell company called American Made Media Consultants Corporation (laughs) and American Made Media Consultants LLC, or AMMC for short. 
uh, was that if it evaded federally mandated disclosures that would have provided insights into where Trump's campaign cash was being funneled. Even some of Trump's top advisors and campaign staff who were aware of the company say they knew next to nothing about the operations there. Campaign finance records reveal that more than $600 million was spent through AMMC, but it's unclear where the money went. Are you reminded, Dana, as I'm reminded from Mary Trump's book and talking to Mary Trump about how Trump and the, his brothers and sisters funneled all of the money out of their dad's business? Absolutely. They, he's, they, they've done this for decades. That was my very first thought, jumped immediately to Mary and, and what her uncle and, and siblings did to her, her family, her dad, and all that. Um, and, you know, how they basically funneled all of, uh, through, through some company, through some construction consulting company, all of the money out of uh, their dad's business into their own pockets uh, to, to avoid paying taxes on it. Right. And then we had, of course, the $700,000 or so in consulting fees paid to Triple T LLC, which is Trump, 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 uh, you know, for um, consulting fees for Ivanka right. when, when she was working uh, also at the Trump Organization. Illegal. Um, so this is what they do. This is how they roll. Uh, and this is fun. Trump's campaign leaders even launched an internal audit of the shell company and operations under a former campaign manager named Brad Parscale, <laughs> but never reported the results of that review. That's from Business Insider. And most of AMMC's money, some $415 million, was actually spent after Parscale was ousted as the campaign manager in July. Ousted is funny. He was drunk and arrested on the oh, street. Um, yeah, I, I, there was a big <laughs> bless his heart coming. That was an ugly video. <laughs> Ugh. Uh, the final few months of the race uh, is also when the Trump campaign became glaringly strapped for cash. Kushner, Dahlman, and Parscale all declined to comment for the story. Hmm. But Laura Trump and John Pence appeared keen to wash their hands of AMMC. Quote, Laura Trump and John Pence resigned in October of 2019 to focus solely on their campaign activities. However, there was never any ethical or legal reason why they could not serve on the board in the first place. John and Laura were not compensated by the AMMC for their services as board members. That's from the Trump campaign communications director, Tim Murtaugh. Uh-huh. The Federal Elections Commission has the power to issue fines if it concludes campaign finance laws were breached, but the Department of Justice could also open a criminal investigation into federal pro- if federal prosecutors believe knowing and willful violation of election laws took place. Hmm. A former Republican chair of the FEC, Trevor Potter, filed a civil complaint in July charging the Trump campaign was disguising some $170 million in spending by laundering the funds through AMMC. That's the former Republican chair of the FEC. Yeah. And thank God my rep, Tim Liu, actually called for an investigation into this, which it should be, and with another representative uh, in, in the House. And it's just the grift that keeps on grifting. Like this, the amount that they have stolen from the American people is mind-blowing. Mm-hmm. There's no even. There's not even any comedy in it. It's just one. Of, it's just one of those things where I'm like, what the fuck? Are there ever going to be consequences to this shit? Oh my goodness! Well, we do have some interesting uh, news from Fox News, um, which is which. It's it's sort of these times where you go, huh? Uh, something surprising Bro? happened, yeah, on Lou Dobbs's show, and this was um, on Friday. Uh, so Dobbs, who we all know, is basically the opinion host, and he's a, a staunch conservative ally of President Trump, who was consistently raged over the past month that the president was robbed of a second term by a rigged election. He introduced a segment that basically calmly debunked several accusations of fraud that Rudy Giuliani and other Trump supporters have lobbed against the election technology company Smartmatic. Now, he then introduced Edward Perez, who is an election tech expert, to give his assessment of the claims Trump was making about Smartmatic. So Perez then appeared in an apparently untaped, uh, pre-taped segment, excuse me, where he shot down various conspiracy theories in response to questions from an off-camera, unidentified voice that wasn't Dobbs's, <laughs> which is just fucking weird in its Fox <laughs> News lawyer, for sure. I know. <laughs> I've had him, like, blurred out with a voice change. Uh, so the segment, turns out, uh, was in response. This is the big deal. This is in response to a 20-page legal demand letter that was sent this month by Smartmatic to Fox News Media. So not just Fox News, the entire media corporation. Similar letters went to Fox's smaller competitors on the right, Newsmax and One American News, as we all know, is just OAN. The letters demanded a full and complete retraction of all false and defamatory statements and reports. Aired by the network, in its coverage, 
of the November 3rd presidential election, which has been a shit ton of false <laughs> reports. Specifically, though, the company charged, Fo- and this is a quote, Fox News has engaged in a concerted disinformation campaign against Smartmatic, you think? Fox News told its millions of viewers and readers that Smartmatic was founded by uh, the late Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez. Yes, that its software was designed to fix elections and that Smartmatic conspired with others to defraud the American people and fix the 2020 U.S. election by changing, inflating, and deleting votes, which is hugely incorrect. So Fox News confirmed to the Washington Post on Saturday that the fact-checking segment seen on Dobbs' show Friday night will also air, where? On Justice with Judge (laughs) Janine. So that's hosted by the the always drunk Janine um, Pirro and Sunday Morning on and um, also the show Sunday Morning Features hosted on Sunday Morning by Maria Bartiromo. So the shows mentioned in the demand letter, those are the other two shows that they are going after. Um, and basically Smartmatic has demanded that the corrections, they have to be published on multiple occasions and they must be made during primetime shows uh, so as to, quote, match the attention and audience targeted with the original defamatory publications. So they're like, <laughs> all those people you reached with the bullshit, you need to reach them with this correction. Otherwise, we're suing your ass, basically. Mm, yeah, it's going to ha- they're going to have to start. I think there's going to be a lot more legal action. And I think there has been in the past that we might not know about, like that time Fox News had to stop tweeting and they stopped tweeting for like eight months. <laughs> It was really weird. Everyone was like, uh. They're, and Fox News is like, it's be- it's an out of protest. And we're like, nah, I think you got a letter. Yeah. <laughs> I think you got a letter, buddy. <laughs> um, so that's very interesting. Uh, we're we're going to keep our eye on that. And we're, we'll, you know, we'll keep reporting. I- I'm sure Fox is going to have some more corrections to make. Newsmax apparently is like, nah, we, we don't, we aren't responsible for the people who come on and talk uh, on our show. Okay. Uh, but they, they could actually face legal action if they don't, because uh, I, I have a feeling that this 22-page letter uh, is probably very uh, accurate and, and rightfully has, you know, has got a lot of oomph behind it. So if Newsmax doesn't do it. Absolutely. Are you kidding? Fox News wouldn't retract anything unless there was some, like, legal craziness mm-hmm. down their throat. Mm-hmm. Uh, Next up, though, from the Associated Press, contradicting his Secretary of State and other top officials, Trump on Saturday suggested without evidence that China, not Russia, is behind the cyber espionage operation against the United States and tried to minimize its impact. In his first comments on the breach, this is the first time he spoke about it, Trump scoffed at the focus on the Kremlin and downplayed the intrusions which the nation's cybersecurity agency has warned posed a grave risk to government and private networks. Quote, the cyber hack is far greater in the fake news media than in actuality. I have been fully briefed and everything is well under control. That's in a Trump tweet, clearly written by Dan Scavino. He also (laughs) claimed that the media are petrified of discussing the possibility that it may be China. It may, he adds. There is no evidence to suggest that is the case. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said late Friday that Russia was pretty clearly behind the operation (laughs) against the United States. Quote, this was a very significant effort. And I think it's the case now. We can say pretty clearly it was the Russians that engaged in this activity. Pompeo said that in the interview with radio talk show host Mark Levin. Dick. Officials at the White House have been preparing to had been preparing to put out a statement Friday afternoon that accused Russia of being the main actor. But we're told at the last minute to stand down. That's according to one U.S. official familiar with the conversations who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss private deliberations. So Trump told him to stop it. Um, it's not clear whether Pompeo got that message before his interview, though. Uh, But officials are now scrambling to figure out how to square the disparate accounts. The White House did not immediately respond to questions about the statement or the basis of Trump's claims about China. The State Department also did not respond to questions about Pompeo's remarks. So there we are. (laughs) What a shit show. The entire thing. The the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing anymore. I don't know if they Mm -mm. ever did, actually. Mm -mm. Yeah. These are fun for us because we're as soon as something said and Trump comes out and he's like, no, that's not true. It wasn't Russia. It could have been China. Definitely China. Mm-hmm. Pompeo's like, shut the- Oh my God. Why do I even work here? <laughs> Poor guy's just trying to save his political career. Oh, um, which is just so down the tubes already. I mean, uh, ugh. 
Okay, so this is funny because I keep getting all of these stories about Fox News. I don't know why I find this one funny because it's not funny. I mean, sexual harassment is sexual harassment, no matter who it's being directed at. I just think that it's it's rampant at Fox News. It always has been. Um, a federal judge ruled Friday that Fox Nation commentator Britt McHenry can sue both her former co-host, George Tyrus Murdoch, as he goes by, uh, for his unusually crude and clumsy alleged campaign of sexual harassment and water world executive producer jennifer um roche for mm. retaliating against her for complaining about it so this is really interesting yeah McHenry's allegations against the fox corporation have been dismissed and fox news has not yet filed a motion to dismiss her attorney eric fudeli from the bloom firm applauded the court for finding tyrus's claims wrong and incorrect so a little more than a year ago McHenry uh filed a federal lawsuit against tyrus who's an ex-professional wrestler <laughs> i'm sorry of sexual harassment um both currently hosts sh- they both currently host shows on fox nation uh the streaming service spinoff of the actual network uh McHenry's is titled unpc as you said in the beginning and tyrus's is nuff said that's it just nuff said He's a man of many words. No said. Uh, McHenry and Tyrus formerly co-hosted on PC between September 2018 and April 2019. Now, McHenry's claims that Tyrus began, quote, making sexual advantage to McHenry and making sexually harassing comments to her and sending her inappropriate texts without her consent. Some of them were like, I love your legs. Tyrus allegedly texted McHenry on November 2nd, 2018. Other messages quoted in McHenry's complaint show Tyrus writing her, uh, fuck them, you're beautiful, I love that picture, your is spelled incorrectly in the text, I just want to point that out um, for anyone curious. And um, fuck them, what, were people calling her ugly? Yeah, like, I, I don't yeah. know. Mm-hmm. Fuck them, your are you are beautiful i love that picture another one fyi you'll need those legs to escape from me in montana that one sounds a little more um terrifying um the next one says i please especially on your knees hotness and asking is it creepy how i look at you um, I haven't seen the text. Yes. The answer is fucking yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> On November 5th, 2018, Tyrus texted McHenry, uh, dick pic coming in five seconds. That's a hell of a warning. That reminds me of the movie Twister, where she's like, we didn't have any warning. <laughs> it, it was just hit like all of a sudden, and we couldn't get out of the way. Oh my God. You got to fix it, oh Joe. This is what you do. Chase those dick pics. Come up with an early warning system. Oh, my God. Not even for I, I can't. I'm 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 trying not to make jokes during this segment because obviously it is serious, but it's 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 hard to take this guy seriously. Uh, Tyrus claims that messages like those were not sexual advances, or, yeah, or propositions. An assertion that U.S. District Judge Paul Eng- Engelmeyer rejected. The the judge uh, said, "Yeah, I don't fucking think so," because they clearly are <laughs> propositions and sexual advantage. Yeah, the one about the one about you'll need those legs to escape from me in Montana is creepy and scary i just watched uh and the last quote and i'll tell you but his uh, this is a quote his communications as pled are readily construed to reflect sexual advances and propositions albeit unusually crude and clumsy ones toward her uh engelmeyer wrote in a 48 page ruling and it just reminds me i just i'm i know i'm way behind on this but i started watching the morning show on apple tv which is Mm. basically the story of um oh what is his name do you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Uh, the morning she hit the button on his desk. Lauer? Matt? Yes, the Matt Lauer story. It's loosely based on that, but it just feel like it's the same sort of like grossness. Uh, mm-hmm. ugh. Yeah, there's been so many allegations at Fox News. And I like how the judge was like, his communications, albeit crude and clumsy. I know. Were sexual advances in propaganda. I like how the judge is like, um, you're not even a smart predator. Like yeah. brace, basically is what that's saying. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I, yeah. I think it's like just because you suck at sexually harassing someone doesn't mean you didn't do it. Right. Exactly. Uh, and and it's frightening and gross. And and yeah, I know I joke about the fact that their show is co- about being not politically correct and and all that other stuff. I this is seriously no joking matter. I hope I hope everybody knows where I'm coming from on this. I, I had tried to make that clear in the story. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just, it's, it's a horrible subject and it's, it's, it's news that these 
I just, these guys, like, I really do feel for you straight women. And listen, I know it's not all men that are sexually harassing people, but man, it sure seems to happen a lot more from them. No, and I think that's the reason I laugh is because just, the, I get so many, I mean, you've seen the gif of the woman with the 800 hot dogs landing on her face. Like, that's yeah. what it's like to be on the, on the internet as God. a woman. And so just to, you know, I think I think laughing at some of the the ways that these people approach you is is one of the ways that you cope with it. Yeah. So I, I just want everyone to understand, you know, know that that's where I'm coming from. Anyway, um, th there's more seditious shit going on in this country, and and there was this bizarre Oval Office meeting on Friday, uh, and we're going to talk about that with Andrew Laufer. We're going to discuss the implications and why nobody should worry that about a military coup. Don't worry about that. Um, anyway, after that, we'll be talking with long crime reporter Adam Klosfeld. We're going to talk about the state of election lawsuits. So we have all that coming up. Stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, it's AG. Today's episode of Daily Beans is brought to you by American Giant. You know, back in the 60s, 95% of clothing was made in the United States. Well, today only 3% is. Have you ever wondered nowadays why we make our stuff overseas? Well, because it's cheaper, obviously. And that's both for price and quality. So most of the stuff we buy feels disposable and poorly made. And that's why I think right now it's a perfect time to buy clothes made here. And I want to tell you about American Giant, where they want to make things better by making better things. American Giant has built a 100% United States-based supply chain, along with strong relationships to factories, workers, and communities at every step of the way. It's not the cheapest, but it makes for a better sweatshirt and it's better for our people and the planet and that's why it's so important american giant makes clothing that's durable not disposable you 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 know you use it more so you need to buy less and so their clothes don't end up in landfills because they're made to be worn and kept longer and so i just recently got their fleece trucker jacket it's perfect for the winter it's so warm and snuggly it's super comfortable it's very beautiful the quality is incredible it's manufactured here in the united states supporting local communities and factories and workers so check out american giant and get the best most quality clothes on the market and get 15 percent off when you first order when you use promo code daily beans at american-giant.com that's 15 percent off when you use code daily beans at american-giant.com all right everybody welcome back today i'm speaking with civil rights attorney andrew laufer about this wild meeting that apparently allegedly took place in the oval office andrew how are you i'm doing all right allison how are you <laughs> trying trying to get through this week uh, and, of course, the next month. <laughs> Same here. I mean, it's, there's a lot of craziness going on right now. Yeah, and the thing I wanted to talk to you about, because there seems to be a little bit of a battle going on on the socials about how we should feel about what um, it was reported from this Oval Office meeting um, from a thread from Maggie Haberman of the New York Times, and everyone kind of knows how I feel about her reporting. She said Sidney Powell was in the Oval Office, and they were discussing making her special counsel for election fraud. Um, and there was a lot of pushback on that, Meadows and even Rudy Giuliani. But Giuliani separately, I guess, had pushed the Department of Homeland Security earlier this week to seize control of voting machines. And then the meeting apparently got, quote unquote, raucous with various administration members drifting in, in and out and different people arguing um, and the fact of the meeting and Giuliani's hope of seizing voting machines, she says, has alarmed some of the president's advisors. Meadows and, and Cipollone repeatedly objected to those suggestions. And then one person floated an executive order to seize the voting machines. And that was also shot down. And then Flynn was there talking about martial law. So it was just an absolutely bonkers uh, uh, probably supposed to be off the record meeting, but I, I wanted your thoughts on, because people seem to be worried about uh, a potential coup, military coup, and I'm I'm trying to sort of smooth over all of that because we we already know the Secretary of the Army and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and said, we're not getting involved in this shit. So can you talk a little bit about how should we be worried and what should we, we be worried about? We, we should absolutely not be worried about it. I mean, I understand why people are worried about it because it is POTUS, and his staff talking about insanity. I mean, this meeting sounds more like a uh, group therapy meeting at a, um, you know, at an insane asylum trying to work out, you know, you know, demons from delusional people. I mean, it really is. I mean, it, you know, the Kraken lawyer attempting to somehow lead the charge here in, 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 in overthrowing the will of the people is, is laughable. I mean, you know, 
nothing is going to happen here. I mean, I understand that POTUS is saying these things, that, that we've got you know, federal employees of the executive branch high up seriously discussing this nonsense. We've got Flynn who pled guilty um, to you know, lying to the FBI. He's a felon as far as I'm concerned. Um, regardless of pardoning, you know, you're still, you're still a convicted felon. You just, you know, you're, 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 you know, the sentence aspect um, and, and the crime are, are pardoned, so to speak. You know, uh, uh, washed away, but the sin of the original crime is still there. So, look, I, it's, it's just stupid. It's laughable. It's nonsense. It's not going anywhere whatsoever. There's no backing from, you know, the military. It's laughable. I mean, the, you know, who are they going to get? Like a handful of, like, these, you know, AR, you know, guys with ARs. You know, they're going to start storming, you know, the, the beaches around the Potomac, you know, to, to take the government down. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's insane and it's stupid and it's nothing to worry about. Yeah. And, and I think I think the main question here is, I mean, I know that we don't have anything to worry about as far as a military coup or martial law goes. But the fact that it's being talked about and planned, uh, I mean, isn't that illegal i mean i i know that it's ridiculous like it's almost uh, like a like they're doing a script pitch to to mark burnett but it still seems like a a plot to overthrow the duly elected incoming government and i i think we have rules against that for specific reasons or do we not take ser- or do we not consider it uh, an actual threat if there's nothing they can really do. Well, it's, it, it could be. You know, we, you really got to you really got to drill down into the facts here. It's you know, it's, it, it could very well be sedition. It could be conspiracy to commit sedition. Um, you know, you got you have a group, you know, more than one person getting together to plan something, and you got to take an act in furtherance of it in order to have a conspiracy, like a criminal conspiracy. So, did do they have they they have okay they have the formation of the group of people more than one. Do they have an act in furtherance of doing this? Have they done anything? You know, talking about it, you're, on, you're right on the border right there. You're right on the fence. You know? um, is it a, a furtherance in it? Possibly with all the nonsense that Trump has spewed trying to rile people up towards it um, you know, online um, or, or you know, whatever Flynn may have said or whatever else, that could be construed as an act in furtherance of pushing forward this idea of a seditious takeover of the government, of, of, of undermining the Biden administration's ability to, you know, appropriately, you know, um, you know, run the executive branch come Jan 20. I mean, it really, you know, we're there. We're, we're, on, a, we're on a borderline there um, in terms of, you know, whether or not this, is, this has gone far enough to be a criminal conspiracy to, you know, for just sedition. Um, will anything change will come from this? I no, you know, no. I mean, nothing is going to happen. You're going to have part of the country that thinks, you know, Biden's not a duly elected president only because Trump said so, and the Kraken lawyer, uh, you know, is somehow, you know, fighting her hardest to not make us laugh too hard at what the heck she's doing in court. You know, it, it's just, it, it's just laughable. I mean, it, these these people can't, like I think I said on Twitter, plan a brunch let alone plan a seditious takeover of, of our government. So, I, you know, it's not going everywhere, anywhere. People need to calm down. You know, it's another thing that really kind of annoys me when you have, you know, a New York Times reporter like Maggie Haberman, you know, acting as, you know, uh, the, the, the Trump whisperer, you know, um, you know, getting into all this, you know, palace intrigue and nonsense and really freaking people out. You know, she's got a large platform because she's a Times reporter. It's frustrating because there's some very good reporters at the New York Times. They do some excellent work, but they also have a lot of issues. And one of their issues is Maggie Haberman. And, and she and others like her in the media are part of the problem. They're giving you know, a platform to this insanity and this nonsense, you know, which freak people out. Because this is where people go to get their news. This is where people go to get informed. They should go to your podcast more often than they go to the New York Times. But, you know, this is where they get their, their, their knowledge from. So, you know, I, I understand why people are upset and concerned, they really should not be because it's not going to go anywhere. And there's nothing, there's nothing here. It's stupid. You know, it, 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 it angers me. As you can tell, I'm, I'm, I'm angered by this because people, you know, we've been through hell over the last four years. We fought hard to elect Joe Biden, okay? And we, 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 we had a record turnout. And we're going to fight like hell to, to get the Senate on Jan, on Jan 5, you know, for Warnick and, and Ostoff. And 
you know, those are the things we need to focus on. Our victories so far and our victories that we're going to attempt to achieve in the future. We need to win that Senate on Jan 5, okay? And we need to help Joe Biden as much as we can as American citizens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I concur. I think we're, we're, um, we're doing a lot towards that end, and, and that's where we should be focusing our energy. Although, you know, I will say for illegality purposes, because that's kind of where I'm focused. I'm not focused on being worried about whether there's going to be a military uprising or, or an actual, you know, martial law coup. Um, I'm interested in the in the legality of it, especially since Flynn is, is uh, trying to get these things done after he's received a pardon. And, you know, we can't pardon future crimes. But... Oh. Uh, Asher, Asher Rangappa posted yesterday, she learned that seditious conspiracy, unlike regular criminal conspiracy, actually doesn't require an overt act um, in order for the crime to be completed. And she posted something from St. John's um, about elements of the offense. Uh, and part three ser- uh, there says the plain language of the modern statute requires no overt act as an element of the offense. And courts have specifically interpreted the statute not to not require an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Wow. I didn't know. I didn't know that either. I have to. I want to look at that statute. That's very interesting. Well, if that's the case, then we're there. They've committed seditious conspiracy, as far as I'm concerned. What I've seen out, you know, in in the public sphere is they've clearly crossed that line. If if there's no act in furtherance requirement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because here here I'll, and I'll send you the link too. It says to support a conviction for seditious conspiracy. The government must prove. And of course, there is beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'm sure that the other federal criminal uh, requirements still apply, meaning it can't, you know, it has to withstand an appeal uh, after a conviction. But it says that there, number one, there exists a conspiracy between two or more people to either levy war against or oppose by force the authority of the United States government to overthrow the United States or to prevent, hinder or delay the execution of any law of the United States. Yeah. Um, and there's no overt thing. So I'll send this to you. But I think that the, I find that to be very interesting. And of course, then you have to add, you know, then there's the whole overarching question of is Biden's Department of Justice going to go after these things uh, sort of, you know, preemptively or perhaps a congressional investigation could make criminal referrals to a Department of Justice. And then would they say, are we going to do this and further? And does it, you know, does it help the United States or do we move forward, which, I, you know, that I hate that that would even be a thing. <laughs> but, you know, that that sort of just introduces the overarching question to every single crime that Trump has committed. And then, you know, finally, we can talk about if he pardons himself, is anybody even going to touch it? Yeah, you know, I, I, I that would infuriate me if that were, you know, the Biden administration's stance. No, we cannot move forward without, you know, dealing with what our country has just been through. Dealing with all the different um, gaps in our laws, in our, um, you know, um, in, in the way we, we rule ourselves, in the way we govern, in the way um, we manage our, 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 our governance. You know, we need to, to repair those things, and we need people who have violated the law to answer for it. You know, I, I said, you know, earlier on, I thought Judge Sullivan was going to ch- uh, challenge Flynn's pardon, and I guess I was wrong about that. I still think he should have tried to, even though it's an enumerated power, you know, in Article One of the President. Um, we cannot give these criminals an inch. We need them to answer for what they did to us. We need to set examples because if we don't make examples, if we don't prosecute these people, it will repeat itself again. Personally, I think the states may go after him first. I, you know, I have a feeling that the New York State AG's office to Shames is going to, you know, just unload, you know, financial tax um, and and, th- and you know indictments like that against Trump and his family and and whoever else possibly broke the law. I, I have a feeling that's probably going to go first, and then the feds may may do, DOJ may do something as DNY or EDNY or whatever. You know, we'll, we'll see how that you know works out. Um, but I think the states will probably end up going first. But the, no, I'm a hundred percent. On the same page as you, these people cannot be allowed to get away with this without being prosecuted. Biden himself should have nothing to do with it. Let his AG figure it out. They think it should be a special prosecutor. Assign a special prosecutor. We've got to give this. We got to do this by the numbers. We got to do this right. 
we got to do this by the law. And it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that Nadler has recently written a letter to the House Judiciary Committee saying he's going to continue the obstruction investigation by reissuing the subpoena for for Don McGahn could be a hint that they're, uh, you know, at, like willing to look at and continue investigating other things. And if, in fact, this, uh, you know, sedition conspiracy doesn't require an overt act and Michael Flynn is doing this after his pardon, we could possibly see some further investigations, at least in into that, because I think the term post pardon uh, crime is going to be something that we hear a lot in yeah. 2021. I agree with that. And that's completely correct. You know, he's not pardoned for anything he does. You know, his crimes are not forgiven for anything that he's done after the pardon. Also, you know, if you look at the pardon, you know, it, it really just kind of na- narrows around the Mueller investigation. Doesn't touch upon anything he may have done under the military code, um, which I find interesting, you know. Um, so I don't know if his past deeds you know, in relation to maybe betrayal of our country, you know, have been washed away by that pardon. Well, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Yeah. And uh, although I don't think, uh, at least from some JAGs that I know, where you can't take someone to court martial who's no longer in the military, but, you know, I mean, everything's up in the air because everything is unprecedented. We have no... We have no case law for any of this, and especially the corrupt pardons, and uh, we'll just have to see where it goes. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. All right, civil rights expert Andrew Laufer, where can everybody follow you? You can follow me at Laufer Law on Twitter and at LauferLawGroup.com on the World Wide Webs. On the World Wide Webs. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. It's been a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure, Allison. Everybody stick around. I'll be right back with Adam Klasfeld for an update on the election lawsuits. Stay with us. Hey, everybody, it's AG. Uh, My favorite part of the day is shower, shower time. It's so nice and hot and delicious and lovely. I get my best ideas in the shower. It's relaxing. I can unwind from the news. It's truly extraordinary. Now that I have Nebbia, they have revolutionized my entire shower experience. They are backed, first of all, by the biggest names in Silicon Valley, including Tim Cook, and it's designed by former Tesla, NASA, and Apple engineers who spent years researching and developing a superior shower experience that actually saves water. And it's anything but ordinary. The Nebbia takes your shower to a different level. It's like a steam room combined with an invigorating shower. After a Nebbia shower, I feel very relaxed and recharged. It's like I spend a day at the spa. The Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower, Nebbia's most advanced shower yet. It has twice the coverage and half of the water usage of standard shower heads. Despite using 45% less water, it sprays 81% more powerfully than the competition. Nebbia's atomized droplets rinse shampoo and conditioner out of the thickest, longest hair. It can be easily installed in 15 minutes. If you can change a light bulb, you can install Nebbia by Moen. Nebbia balance is functionality with beauty as well. It has four premium finishes to complement any bathroom. They have white and chrome, spot-resistant nickel, which is what I have, matte black and black and chrome, and they offer accessories like shelves and shower curtains, which pair perfectly with the shower stunning design. The Nebbia by Moen Spa Shower starts at just $1.99, and for the Daily Beans listeners, we have a deal for you. The first 100 people to use code BEANS at Nebbia.com will get 15% off site-wide. Nebbia rarely does deals like this, so this is a great deal to jump on, so go to Nebbia.com slash beans. That's Nebbia, N-E-B-I dot com slash beans to check out what they have to offer. Again, the first 100 people to use the code beans right now when checking out will save 15%. Again, that's nebbia.com slash beans and use the code beans to save 15%. All right, everybody, welcome back. Joining me now is intrepid reporter from Law and Crime, formerly of Courthouse News, and the best follow on Twitter if you want live action tweeting from inside the courtrooms with a lot of these hearings. Welcome, Adam Klasfeld. Adam, it's good to talk to you again. Great to talk to you again, too. I would love to get an update where we are uh, on the 9 million election cases uh, that have been filed and subsequently turned down and lost and kicked out of court. If you if you have a little bit of an update for us, that would be wonderful. <laughs> well, uh, today uh, we have the sort of revolving door of one is rejected, another becomes alive. And the one that's rejected is a post-election. This one actually isn't one to overturn the 2020 election, but one involving the Georgia runoffs. It's uh, the Kelly Loeffler and, uh, and also the National Republican Party, state Republican parties uh, suing over rules with the Georgia runoffs. they had filed a series of cases. Uh, both There were two that went to federal court on the same day, both rejected. 
by federal judges on that same day, one uh, Obama appointee, one George W. Bush appointee. Now, the ruling that came down just today was the 11th Circuit uh, affirming the ruling by the uh, Obama appointed judge tossing this out. Uh, and basically saying, you guys don't have standing there. You can't prove a concrete injury. And so we're seeing now, even as the desperate last gasp lawsuits from the Trump campaign sort of, you know, they're still fighting them. And uh, but they become less important because it's over. Uh, the Georgia runoffs are actually ahead. And those are uh <laughs> those cases are getting dismissed just as quickly. Um, an interesting thing about the 11th Circuit uh, affirmation today, it affirmed a case where the judge repeatedly cited the case of Lynn Wood, uh, who failed in his post-election lawsuit and basically established this precedent in that's binding upon Georgia courts from the 11th Circuit a very conservative uh, appellate court and one of the most conservative courts in our nation, basically saying he had no jurisdiction. And it made these courts, it made these cases uh, more difficult to get out the gates, uh, even if there were some merit to it. Uh, the other thing that happened just today was uh, Trump, undeterred by the string of losses in federal court, is taking uh, it, his... Uh, a, a, a petition for cert to the Supreme Court. Uh, this is the first one he is quick to point out that is actually his uh, cert petition. Uh, the unanimous agreement right now is that this is a very, very far long shot of success. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and part of the reason for that is what he's actually appealing are cases from November, uh, decisions from November, so Pennsylvania Supreme Court decisions, excuse me, from November and one from October. So he's he's appealing Pennsylvania Supreme Court decisions directly to the Supreme Court? <laughs> yes. Under, I, let me ask you real quick, under what mechanism can he do that? Now, we, we know that Texas went directly to the Supreme Court. It was determined they didn't have standing to sue another state for election stuff. But there is some sort of a constitutional rule that says if a state's going to sue another state, they can go directly to the Supreme Court. What Under what rule does Donald Trump think he can go to directly to the Supreme Court with this these cases that were tossed out or already decided upon or adjudicated by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? He is what what Rudy Giuliani, who signed the statement announcing this lawsuit, uh, is doing is constantly analogizing this to Bush v. Gore. Well, of course, it, it's nothing like Bush v. Gore. Uh, Bush v. Gore came down to, uh, you know, just from a very logistical standpoint, it was a, a, a about a recount involving a few hundred ballots. Uh, it's very different margin of victory here. Some uh, tens of thousands of votes he, he would like to change uh, Trump. Uh, also, it's very different. This uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court was interpreting state law, what the state law found. And uh, it's, uh, there is another, so that's the, what this is being billed as. He's saying, oh, just like the Supreme Court uh, was he reviewing uh, the Florida Supreme Court's rules back then during the time of Bush v. Gore, uh, the Supreme Court can hear this in Pennsylvania, although it's an entirely different situation. And uh, the the in the basically most legal experts who look at this don't think there's any sort of serious chance of this even being heard. Yeah, I imagine it'll be thrown out on standing as well, um, which like the Texas like the Texas one was. And uh, a question about the 11th Circuit one today, because I know you covered the district court case that they affirmed, right? You covered that story. What is it they were trying to do? What was Loeffler trying to do uh, in Georgia? Was she trying to, uh, what was she trying to do? She was essentially challenging certain uh, ballot rules. Now, there were, there you 
in terms of the case that uh, that Loeffler's campaign joined, hers was challenging certain practices of signature matching. And what they wanted to do, um, and the case went to oral arguments, when early voting has already been, had already started, they wanted to make a uh, signature matching, just raise the bar and have more people uh, challenging whether they believe the signature was legitimate. Um, this was uh, one thrown out as untimely. Uh, it was also thrown out on a standing ground. Uh, and it was this sort of thing. One thing that was very interesting about her hearing, and I remember covering it, uh, right now you see this pivot happening in uh, Republican election challenges where the Trump lawsuits were just so meritless and so disastrous that right now Loeffler has hired, her legal team included some serious lawyers uh, that, and including big law, <laughs> essentially, uh, McGuire Woods, a major law firm and the type of firm that would not go anywhere near the Trump cases. And you had one of her attorneys stand up in court saying, and I believe this is a near direct quote, I, I don't have a committed to memory, I am not Lynn Wood, I am not Rudy Giuliani, uh, I, and just saying who he is not, uh, because the, this presumably uh, this entire record of these meritless cases had grown too toxic. Uh, and they are trying to argue that, oh, we just want to make a small change uh, to how signature matching is conducted to, uh, to thwart the possibility of fraud. And one of the reasons why the court found a lack of standing uh, at the trial court level, now affirmed on appeal, was that they are trying to prevent a speculative injury. You don't have standing if you are speculating that if there that there could be fraud, and to prevent this hypothetical fraud uh, that hasn't been shown to be an actual risk, but that's another argument. I get it. So, so the the case isn't ripe. Like, we we haven't had a bunch of people harmed by signatures not matching. Come back when you have that. So, w what are the odds? Uh, uh, probably a hundred percent that there will be lawsuits about signature matching after the election, if if, if the Republicans lose the, <laughs> lose the race. <laughs> well, we will we'll see what happens. But in terms of what happened during the oral arguments, the the judge again, uh, as I mentioned, found a lack of standing because it was total speculation. And the you also had the lawyers for the local and national Republicans as well as the campaigns basically uh, saying, oh, we just want this, kind of distancing themselves from this, uh, let's overthrow the entire way elections are conducted, and in some cases, throw, overthrow the election. Uh, they said, no, we just want to make this small change. The court disagreed that it was a minor request, but you see this pivoting happening now as big laws now taking the driver's seat after in mm. the post uh, certification era as the Trump suits, though they may still exist, fade into the background. Uh, big law is trying to give it a, a sheen and trying to uh, say, no, we're doing something different here. We're not Lynn Wood. We are not Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> I'm not Sidney Powell. I'm not the Kraken. I won't be releasing anything in your courtroom. Um, wow, that's really interesting to try to put, get, give a big law sheen to these suits. Um, it's, speaking of the Kraken, you had reported about Detroit uh, filing a complaint for sanctions uh, against some of these lawyers bringing these incredibly numerous and frivolous lawsuits. What, what can you tell us about that? So here's the interesting thing about that. It, the sanctions motion was, we know about it because it was tweeted out. It's a Rule 11 motion for sanctions. And under that rule, there needs to be a notice period. 
that if you're going to pursue vigorous sanctions against a party like the Kraken, uh, you have to give them an opportunity to withdraw the lawsuit. Uh, and so there's a 21 day window period. And this motion became public. It hasn't been filed yet from a strictly procedural angle. They need to give the guy, give the legal team, Sidney Powell and everyone else an opportunity to respond and withdraw. It should be mentioned uh, since that news broke, uh, they pursued their Michigan litigation to the Supreme Court. So it does not look like they're withdrawing. It looks like this will become a live issue. But uh, the city of Detroit has been one of the most, uh, they, they have been represented by some of the most passionate litigators. Uh, and they have said, uh, actually their lead attorney, David Fink, has pursued sanctions before uh, against other parties in state and federal court. Uh, he has compared uh, what Trump is doing to the, uh, Marshall McLuhan, the medium is a message that in television, television itself is as a medium conveys a message. With Trump, the lawsuit convey, conveys a message. And that message is don't trust the election. There's something awry uh, that it's an anti, it's a message that is attacking the democratic process. And uh, so he has said uh, in interviews and he's said and argued in his legal briefs that this is an anti-democratic attack uh, that the court needs to essentially put an end to it with serious penalties. Mm. And the serious penalties that he's talking about here, uh, he wants uh, one to slap them with financial penalties. He wants to uh, ban all of the lawyers who brought the case to the Eastern District of Michigan to be barred from ever practicing there again. He wants the judge uh, to essentially uh, refer all of the legal team there to uh, the state bar for uh, grievance proceedings. And he has, uh, David Fink and the rest of the city of Detroit uh, have been one of the most vocal about uh, putting some consequences for this litigation. And so far, he's been pretty much uh, alone in taking uh, that action and be very interesting to see if other cities and other parties follow suit. Um, uh, although we are seeing particularly with the Kraken legal team, uh, there have been, uh, even since that discussion, we'll see what happens with the sanctions case, uh, Lynn Wood, had uh, tweeted recently that there was an order to show cause where he was trying to represent Carter Page in proceedings in Delaware, uh, where he claims, and uh, there the I don't have a copy of the order to show cause. This is Linwood's characterization, but he claims that the uh, judge is uh, asking whether he should be disqualified for some of his litigation tactics during the post-election uh, season. So we'll, we'll, I'm uh, seeking a copy of that order to show cause right now, and we'll see what consequences come to these attorneys for uh, filing litigation that keeps getting thrown out of court by uh, judges who say there's nothing there. Um, and is just plainly filled with conspiratorial um, fever dreams. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Is that, I wonder if that's the one that he filed under plenty of perjury instead of penalty of perjury. That was hilarious. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting, uh, Fink's uh, argument here, right? Because he's, he's saying it's not the merits of these cases at the heart of this. It's the fact that they're being filed by the president and that and the message that that conveys. And it just reminds me of when Trump was telling you know, Giuliani and Shokin and everybody in the Ukraine matter, hey, I don't need you to actually do an investigation. I just need you to announce one. You know, it seems like there's this commonality of 
like one of those kind of lawyers who'll say something totally prejudicial in front of the jury and then say, I withdraw my remarks, and then they'll have to strike it from the record, but you can't unring the bell. It just seems like that's what he's doing with these cases. And that's a very interesting argument by think in this Detroit sanctions case. So we'll have to wait uh, for that to ripen, I guess, 21 days after they are all informed that they're, you know, uh, having their to be to be able to respond uh, to 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 the sanctions that I'm about to file, but it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, so the Kraken team is not the only one who are battling these sanctions motions. David Fink, uh, again with the city of Detroit, is has sued uh, another party that's uh, been pushing the uh, the Trump suits. Uh, they include two pro-Trump charities. One of them is uh, a group by the name of the Thomas More Project, and they've filed lawsuits around the country uh, in saying that they they have described the project, I think they call it the Amistad Project, uh, they've described Rudy Giuliani as a partner. So this is another group that is subject to a different sanctions motion, that one in a state court. So uh, there are many battles for sanctions going on now. And the city of Detroit's argument is that this is the, the medium is a message. They're going to keep sending these lawsuits, each of them sending an anti-democratic message that will only be quelled if there are serious consequences. Uh, for doing so. So that's the argument that they're making. And uh, we'll see that play out in multiple courts right now. And we'll see one, one of the interesting things about these sanctions, particularly Rule 11 sanctions, a judge can, uh, can issue them uh, sua sponte. So the, a judge can decide that certain conduct is sanctionable. Uh, regardless of what happens, even if, uh, let's say, uh, from, um, from my conversations with uh, folks on, on this issue, let's say that the city of Detroit, uh, or, or rather Sidney Powell withdrew the litigation under threat of sanctions, um, that doesn't necessarily end the matter. The judge might want to take action based on uh, all of the things that she found in her ruling. So that's uh, something we'll see play out, uh, mm. particularly as as the flow of litigation doesn't stop. You know, there's now a case in uh, New Mexico. Um, none of it, you know, it's all a sideshow, um, but it still sends the message of this is under dispute, even if the Supreme Court has looked at those disputes. Uh, thought that it wasn't worth anything more than a few sentences to reject it. And uh, so it's just a lot of it spinning the wheels, but uh, we'll see how long those wheels keep spinning. Mm. That's interesting to know, too, about Sue Sponte. I wonder why there hasn't been any judge who who has just done this already without any filings being done. But, you know, I, this this administration has been shown exceeding grace uh, and not just in this, but in in many uh, lawsuits that have been going on for for multiple years, with uh, stays being awarded where they wouldn't probably normally be awarded, and and things like that. Just I think just because it's the president, we have to make sure due diligence and due process are are in place, and nobody wants to step over that that line into into going from apolitical to political. So. Anyway, thank you so much. Everybody follow Adam Klasfeld. You write for Law and Crime. It was absolutely wonderful talking to you. I appreciate your update today. Thank you for having me. I know you guys are super slammed right now, so I appreciate it. Uh, everybody stick around. We'll be right back for the good news. Hey, everybody. It's AG. I'm here to tell you about my favorite thing that I've ever put in my mouth. It's called Magic Spoon Cereal. When I was a kid, I loved cereal, but I had to give it up as an adult because of all the carbs and sugar and all the chemicals and stuff in it. But I am excited to tell you about Magic Spoon. It's so tasty, you will not believe it's made without all the sugar, carbs, and guilt. Truly, Magic Spoon is so good, you will not believe it's also healthy. As Forbes magazine says, with cereal that tastes this good and offers so much nutritional value, as opposed to, well, none, Magic Spoon is the, maybe the future of breakfast. And I agree. Magic Spoon cereals have amazingly zero sugar, 12 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs in each serving. It is, get this, 
Keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, high-protein, and GMO-free. And the best part is delicious with four amazing flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. See where this is going? Super retro, very vintage, and delicious. They taste incredible. It seems too good to be true, but it's not. I, I eat it. It's amazing. My favorite flavor right now is blueberry. It's so yummy. I have it as a snack sometimes. It's healthy and nutritious. It's guilt-free. So go to magicspoon.com slash dailybeans. Grab a variety pack. Try all four flavors today. Be sure to use our promo code Daily Beans at checkout to get free shipping. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash dailybeans and use the code dailybeans for free shipping. And we thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring the podcast. All right, it's time for the good news. Uh, Welcome to the good news. I'm so glad we're here. Oh, thank you. It is nice to be back with you. I always miss you over the weekends. I miss you too. It's good to see you here in the good news room. I like it here. This is where all the good news comes in from our listeners. So if you have good news, whether it's personal, professional, political, anything, even if you just want to send us your pod pet photos, please do that. You can also send confessions and corrections. If I get something wrong, please correct me. Uh, you can do that at dailybeanspod.com and click contact. So let's kick this off. Uh, let's see. First up, we have a submission from Claire, pronouns she and her. Claire says, I've been listening for the last two years when I found you to learn more about the Mueller report, and I've been listening every morning since. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for keeping me sane and educated over this difficult several years when I had to turn off NPR because it was also discouraging. My good news is that this horrible year of 2020 is that I, in this horrible year of 2020, is that I finally finished my PhD in nursing on December 7th. It has been a four-year endeavor, four-plus year endeavor, while working full-time and raising a teenager, holy God, to celebrate. I became a patron, a Patreon member, finally. You kept me laughing, you kept me informed, and you've given me hope, so thank you. As pod tax, I have included pictures of the quarantine puppy, Major, a German Shepherd mix, just like the, uh, Dotus, the the dog of the United States, major, and a th- our thirteen year old seal pup, Annabelle, seal pup. Okay, I'll find out in a second. And our thirteen year old Miley, a rat terrier, all oh, who died on December first. Poor baby. Mm. Also, our seven chickens. Oh my God, the second picture. one of our seven chickens. There. <gasps> the Dodge. Look at his face. Look at the baby. <gasps> Oh, the tiny baby seal pup. Now I get it. Oh, gosh. Okay. It's a doggo, but it looks like a baby seal pup. Mm. So do we Claire, Do we call Claire doctor nurse now? Because she's got a PhD in nursing. So would she be Yes, yeah, she doctor, would be doctor, whatever her last name is. She would be Dr. Claire. She'd mm-hmm. be Dr. Claire. Mm-hmm. I like, we can call her doctor. It's just so confusing when you're also a nurse. You mm-hmm. got a PhD in nursing. Way to, way to go to confuse the masses. <laughs> Hello, doctor nurse. I love it. I think that's so... <laughs> fantastic um and the the chicken sarah is the chicken's name that's perfect i do love that the chicken's name is sarah how brilliant is that hi baby chicken okay that's wonderful congratulations phd seriously so much work with a teenager we've got more doctors there's more doctors kelsey pronouns she and her breaking news i did it i fucking did it Last week, last week, I successfully defended my dissertation and completed my PhD in criminology, law, and society from UCI. Fun twist, my research over the last four years has focused on solitary confinement reform in state prisons. So I spent the last year finishing my dissertation on solitary confinement reform while working full-time for a criminal justice nonprofit where I also supported prisons in reducing solitary confinement use. Mm. Needless to say, 2020 has been a lot of solitary... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. I didn't picture my dissertation defense happening alone in a hotel room, but 2020, I'm super proud of my achievement, and even the anticlimacticness of the moment can't take away that from me. So here's to non medical doctors. Woo woo. I added that. Side note in celebration, my sister's getting me a t shirt based on one, a joke I said adapting Janet Jackson's lyrics to my name, and two, a nod to Hillary. My name is Kelsey, Dr. Nutt, if you're nasty. Mm. Congratulations, Kel- Dr. Dr. Nutt. Congratulations, Kelsey. That is awesome. D- lady doctors, more lady doctors. Mm. Yeah, that is so great. And criminology and law. In fact, you know what's really interesting is when I was talking to Joyce Vance last week when she was on the show, 
she actually had to postpone for like 10 minutes to do the interview because she was sitting on the board for somebody doing their <gasps> oral That's defense so cool. uh, of their PhD in political science. So she was like, I, I'm, just, I'm like, oh, that fucking, can you imagine being like, all right, I'm just about to go in and defend my uh, oral. And then you find out that Joyce Vance is on your <laughs> <laughs> sitting on oh your God, oral no. dissertation defense board. Ah, no big deal. Uh, must have been nerve wracking for that poor candidate. But I'm sure they made it. And just like Kelsey, congratulations. And also, you know, Claire, we've got it's all doctors today in the house. Next up from anonymous pronouns, they and them. You will probably never know how much I value you, um, how much value you've provided to so many people. This is not so much a correction as a suggestion. On several occasions, AG has referred to districts as ruby red. My suggestion is we stop doing that. The Electoral College has sort of made us see things as either red or blue. But in reality, it, the reality is basically everywhere is a shade of purple. Biden got 15,000 more votes in Texas than in New York. And while it comes down to the proportion of votes, Texas has tons of Democrats. This phenomenon takes place everywhere. If a Republican wins a district with 100,000 votes, uh, 100,000 voters by 30 points, that district shouldn't be thought of as ruby red. It has 35,000 Democrats. Being a Democrat in a district and a state that is traditionally Republican can feel very marginalizing because nobody in national politics cares. It also creates a self-fulfilling prophecy because it makes those areas very hard to flip. I think if we're honest, if someone five years ago had said we could turn Georgia uh, blue, we probably would have left. Again, I can't possibly thank you enough for helping us get through this dumpster fire. That's a very good idea. Yeah, I actually heard a really good point once. They said there's no red states and blue states. There's only blue states and voter rep um, repressed states. Ah, mm, so true. Suppressed, voter suppressed states. Because it's true. If there wasn't voter mm -hmm. suppression, I'm not sure another Republican would get uh, <laughs> to elected. Ever, ever elected again. Ever. Yeah. Ever. All right. We got more. This comes from anonymous. Pronoun is she. Hey, Dr. A.G. Drag for short. Uh, good news. I hit 100 sales on my Etsy page. I started 3D Ooh. printing just to make PPE for healthcare workers and ended up having so much fun making things. Selling them has kept my house from being filled up with plastic toys and decorations. It's mostly been good, though I did have one person upset she could not actually swat flies with her Biden-Harris fly swatter. Uh, but as a strict nonviolent vegetarian, I would never manufacture and sell uh, WFDs, weapons of fly destruction. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute. But still, I get to make people happy. And from the proceeds I've donated to the ACLU, Fair Fight, and Planned Parenthood of Indiana. I swear I'll get to you my latest... Uh, I swear I'll get you my latest tree ornaments. Uh, just give a little crazy, just getting a little crazy at work with the whole election thing. I've enclosed pictures of my cat, Ellie, who also likes database administration and inspecting my queries. Ah, uh, yes, look. Yes, the there cat is very, is. very interested in your queries. That's a supervisory cat right there. It sure is. Well, thank you, Anonymous. I appreciate that. I have one ornament on my tree, and I'm not sure if this is the one she sent me, but it's the Fuck 2020 snowflake. Nice. It's the only ornament on my tree right now. So that came in from a listener. I opened that over the weekend. Next up, Tanar's widow, he, him, mister. This is not asking for pity or to make people sad. On Monday the 21st, it will be two years since my late wife ran out of days. Even though we were split up, she was my number one main man. I was about to call her to tease her that it was the shortest day of the year, and we're both the shortest people in our social circles, so it must be a day made for guys like us. Instead, I got a call from her mother letting me know she had gone onward to where there's no more pain or fear or regret. Please save your tears. This is to remember her, not to boohoo. Too late. Tanar, I know. <laughs> Tanar was intellectually fascinated by viral pandemics, especially hemorrhaging, hemorrh hemorrhagic illnesses. She must have read Andromeda Strain too many times in college. The Rona would have widened her eyes with curiosity. She was a feminist and quietly worked to elevate and liberate women and to make spaces safe for marginalized people. Tanar was Southern from Jackson, Mississippi, where she was just too hot to speak any faster, where words like warsh pick up the extra R's that damn Yankees like my family seem to drop. <laughs> and when there's something... When there was never something more cutting than, well, bless your heart. On Monday, please have some dark beer and some dark chocolate and some Coca-Cola. Donate to Planned Parenthood so broke people can get access to health and education and be good stewards of their own junk. Pet a kitty cat. And remember that even though if they were full size, they would eat your face, they're also cute and funny and affectionate <laughs> and furry. <laughs> and I say that to my cat all the time. Like, I know if, you, if, I, if I were smaller, you would eat me. 
Uh, and go reach out to your main people, no matter who they are, no matter how close or far away, and remind them that they're valued and appreciated, even if they know it. It's always good to hear it, and it's always good to say. Tempest fidgets. It won't stand still. Uh, that got me. I know we're not supposed to, but goodness. Just sending love to this person. I, <clears throat> I'm going to have to read this next one. We should, I really, <laughs> they should have rearranged that and put that one to the end. Okay, uh, hold on a minute. <clears throat> okay. Whew, we got more, uh, we got good news coming in. This is from Crystal Lady O, the farm, uh, pronoun she and her. I saw Andrew's post about the grab and by the gra- uh, gavel event coming up this Sunday, and it made me cry. <laughs> Speaking of, um, I thought you guys should know why. The 20th is my eldest birthday. She's Down syndrome. We didn't know before she was born. Hijinks ensued, and she was born at home after we were sent home from the hospital. Luckily, she was born pretty healthy and survived that and the next two months in the NICU. We saw our estimated bill for the first two weeks is already over $23,000, and the hospital administration said it would likely be over $500,000 to a million if she was there for two months. We didn't have to pay any of that because we were <clears throat> on an expanded Medicaid program thanks to ACA. My kid had heart sur- surgery eight months later, again covered by the ACA. It was quite literally saved her life several times over. She now needs an airway surgery if we want to keep her alive. But the pandemic has put that on hold and made her poor ability to breathe an even bigger concern. I'm frightened about what happens if she gets sick with anything. I'm especially terrified of what happens if SCOTUS rules the way that they were set up to do, in spite of the awfulness of the right-wing arguments in the ACA case. We need the Senate if we are to have any hope of keeping kids alive like mine. She'll turn 10 during the live stream, and everybody should know that her wish is to become a magic princess with powers that can make everyone happy. (sighs) How are you doing? Can you finish this one? <laughs> I'll try. We're getting her a dress and a crown and a wand. She will be disappointed that it isn't enough to make the magic work, but she will sing the songs from every strong Disney princess at the top of her lungs trying. So whatever happened that day in all of your personal lives, know there is one awesome little girl trying to have trying her very best to make it a better one, and her life may depend on us winning the Senate. Pictures include Miss Bethany, her doggo Fezzik, and some goat pics. Oh, boy. She's Look at her unicorn she's dress. That's adorable. Beautiful. She's so happy. And that dog. That is a best friend right there. And goats. I needed goats. Thank you for sending goats the last picture. <laughs> <laughs> we needed the last picture so hard. The, oh, shit. The one on top is like, mm, and the one on the bottom is like, Meh. Uh, oh, we'll, my we'll goodness. We'll send it. Ugh. Ugh. I love your listeners. Uh, okay, I gotta get my shit together for this one. <sighs> let okay. me uh, let me let me do this one here. This is from Not That Millionaire. Thank you, honey. A confession. I texted a friend who also listens to the Daily Beans that these days during the Good News Block, I almost <laughs> always end up crying, and that makes me a little concerned about my mental and emotional health. I asked her if it had that effect on her. She wrote that she usually falls asleep before that part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 Attached is my pod pet tax. That's Bella Mac. Or excuse me, that's Bella May, who passed away last month at 16. I miss her every day. Look at that. Oh, sweet, sweet girl. Goodness. (sighs) Well, everyone, thank you for sending these in. Um, These are incredible. We'll have all these pictures for you in the newsletter uh, that comes out. Newsletters come out Monday. The one for last week will come out today. Um... Do you have anything before we sign off? <laughs> Do I have anything before we sign off? Uh, just man, all these are good. I know that even the, I know that even the tears are cleansing, but whew, this one got me today. Thank you so much for the vulnerability with your listeners and sharing your stories with us. <sighs> I appreciate it, and uh, it gives me a little uh, a little perspective and. Um, a little perspective on on the things that I let get to me. So thank you. Mm. Truly. Very well said. Everyone, until tomorrow, please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, take care of the planet, and take care of your mental health. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans.
The Daily Beans is executive produced and directed by A.G. and Jordan Coburn and engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazell and Starburns Industries. Our marketing manager, executive assistant, production and social media direction is Amanda Reeder. Fact-checking and research by A.G., Jordan Coburn, and Amanda Reeder. Our music is written and performed by They Might Be Giants. Our web design and branding are by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. And our website is dailybeanspod.com. <laughs>